Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sabir, and I direct events here at The Strength. Before we launch into a discussion of David Randall's book, Black Death at the Golden Gate, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until, after over 93 years, The Strand is a sole survivor, still run by the Bass family, still selling new and used books. We want to thank all of you for your support today. Without our loyal community of book lovers and authors like David and Mark, we wouldn't be here today. Tonight, we are excited to have with us David K. Randall, who's celebrating the paperback launch of his new book, Black Death at the Golden Gate. David is a senior reporter at Reuters, the New York Times bestselling author of Black Death at the Golden Gate, Dreamland, and the King and Queen of Malibu. He lives in Montclair, New Jersey. Joining David in conversation all the way from London is Mark Honigbaum. Mark is a medical historian, journalist, and author of five books, including The Pandemic Century, 100 Years of Panic, Hysteria, and Hubris, The Fever Trail, in Search of the Cure for Malaria. He is currently a lecturer at the City University of London. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming David and Mark to the stage. Hello, hi. Hello. Hi, David. Hi. 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 Welcome. Thank you for making the time to talk with me. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure. Um, uh, I, I should also say hello to all the um, uh, fans of the Strand Books who have joined, uh, joined us. We can't see you. We trust you're out there. Um, and we'd love to hear your questions. We're going to talk for, what, about 30 minutes or so, David? Does that sound oh, right? Yeah. Um, so we're all isolated in our, our own COVID cubicles on different sides of the world. I'm actually not in London. I've come to Cornwall, uh, which is all the way in the southwest of the UK, uh, because we've been finally told that it's, it's okay to travel now. So everyone in England is, is trying to get their summer holiday sun into this short interval before the next lockdown. <laughs> what is a famously sunny country? So, <laughs> yeah. well, we're, we're having some gaps in the clouds right now. But um, so listen, uh, there's so much to talk about. Um, and definitely one of the things I'd like to make time for is to talk about the parallels between uh, the plague you write about in San Francisco in 1904 and the situation we're living through now with COVID-19. Uh, so many parallels. But first of all, uh, I read your book uh, over the weekend. Really, really, I mean, obviously I've read different accounts of the plague in San Francisco before, um, but what I found really interesting in your book is how vividly you bring to life the characters. Um, I just really want to ask you, what, what, what made you choose the San Francisco play? What attracted you to the story? Well, there were a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I, you know, I grew up in California and I had never heard of the plague at all. Uh, so when I was working on my previous book, which was about the family that owned all of Malibu, California, you know, how they got it and how they lost it and why celebrities live there now, uh, one of the main characters, he went up to San Francisco around 1900, 1901, uh, and he wrote a letter back to his wife saying, you know, this is the wickedest place I've ever seen, and there's rumors that the plague is here. And that's what the word rumors really struck with me, because it really seemed like an outbreak of the plague was something that you'd either know was happening or you didn't, it wouldn't just be kind of in that netherworld. So I started looking into it and I found that it really was one of the first, you know, uh, it was a, a, a fight for the legitimacy of science in many ways. It was the first showdown essentially between the beginning of modern medicine and one of the most ancient and terrifying diseases that we've faced in human history. And then the more I went into it too, it seemed a story of great personalities and, and, and parallels. You can really tell the story of science and, and modern day science through something that happened a hundred years ago. Um, you had two doctors, one who was Dr. Ken, Joseph Kenyon, who really represented the, represented the hard side of science. You know, he was at the forefront of many uh, of, of the, the wave of, you know, sterilization of early medicines. Bacteriology, he was a leading yeah. bacteriologist, yeah. Exactly. And he was, you know, he was the science that we now seen with the science of, you know, white lab coats and microscopes and what we kind of think of as hard science today. Then on the other side, you have Dr. Rupert Blue, you know, who, who barely graduated medical school, who nobody really thought of as a genius, 
but what he had was a talent for affability and he could get people to trust him and, and like him. So he really represented the, the softer side of science, which is, you know, as we go through COVID, re- you start to realize how important that is as well. Mm. Well, let's talk a bit more about uh, Blue and Joseph Kenyon because uh, I was going to ask you, you know, this story has been told before. And yeah. I think you, you mentioned, you acknowledge in your book, you, you got a lot of uh, help from uh, Gunter Rees, right? Who, exactly. Yeah. So, so what was it that, how did, how does your, how is your pr- approach to this subject distinctive? What, what is it you wanted to do in this book that was different? Well, I really wanted to put faces to names and feelings to names. You know, it seemed like in the other treatments of it, it was really academic, you know, and, and for good reason. It really was a landmark uh, outbreak and, and we still learned the lessons from that. And I think many of the approaches have been, let's look at this in terms of medical history and how does that inform future outbreaks and how does that inform future science and I think one thing that was missing was that, you know, these are, these are real people and they have their own motivations. And I think that, that uh, kind of clash between the, what science represented by Kenyon and what science represented by Blue, that was really key. And kind of seeing that you needed that mesh between those two to solve not only this problem, but future problems as well. So, but you're for, are you, am I right in saying you, you have a connection to California, you lived there, you grew up there, yeah. Yeah, I, I grew up there, and that's one of the things that you know, drew to me, drew the story to me as well. You know, I, I lived in San Francisco for a while, I lived in Berkeley for a while, and I've gone through all these places and had never heard of it whatsoever. It, it seemed like a forgotten history in many ways. And it wasn't forgotten in terms of, you know, people who study medical history, but in terms of, you know, a, a general interest reader, general, general, you know, someone who's just kind of interested in history, to have all of these, important things just lost in many ways. You know, there's no markers, there's no memorials, there's, there's nothing essentially. Um, it, it feels important to have that history still be alive to still inform what we're doing now. Now look, there's a tremendous lot of detail in your book. Um, I don't know, I guess we, we can't really rehearse the whole story of the plague outbreak, yeah. uh, which had many different phases, as you know. Uh, you know, it lasted from 1904 1900 to 1904, right? And then there was a gap. And then after the earthquake in San Francisco, I think there was another explosion, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but w- one thing that comes up very strongly is the way that um, the city, you know, the city fathers, uh, the, the mayoralty, the governor of California, but also business leaders and the press were all determined to play down the plague and mm-hmm. almost deny its existence. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you know, how did uh, bubonic plague, the idea of bubonic plague, challenge uh, California's sense of it, identity, its image of this land of opportunity? You know, people were busy boostering California, right? And saying, you know, leave those dirty, crowded, unclean, unhygienic cities in the East and come, you know, to the land of opportunity. Um, so what was the impact of plague? when it started to sink in that maybe you know, this really was here in San Francisco and spreading? It was, a, it was nothing less than an existential crisis. Oh. You know, it was, this is, this is who we are. This is who we've always thought we are. And suddenly we have all these problems that we thought we were going away from. And I think you'll see some of those echoes now in how the U.S. is still reacting to the, the coronavirus pandemic now. It was this idea that you know, American exceptionalism, and it can never happen to us. And though, even though you, you, you know, we saw mm. cities locked down in China, we saw what happened in Europe. Um, there's some, there was that thought that, you know, it's never going to happen to New York. And then once it did happen to New York, the rest of the country thought, oh, it can never happen to us. It can never, you know, this disease that came from, you know, spreading through Asia and Europe, that's never going to hit Arizona. That's never going to hit us in Texas. That's never going to hit us in California. Um, and I think that, that denialism of science comes in a lot of ways from, you know, people not wanting to acknowledge that they're in danger and that they can't ever really run away from the problems. That even if you are next to the Pacific Ocean and you do live in a town where, you know, literally founded on a gold rush where you could just go into the hills and come back a millionaire, um, life will find you and, and bacteria will find you and viruses will find you. So maybe could you just sketch out for our, our listeners, um, how people understood plague uh, at the beginning of this outbreak. Um, 
because it wasn't what it is today. I mean, we didn't have antibiotics. Um, mm -hmm. And as I understand it, people didn't even really even understand or know for sure that how plague was spread. So there were different theories about its spread. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, who was at risk and who wasn't at risk. It was, so this was all coming at a time when it was really the first steps in modern medicine. This was when doctors were first starting to recognize, you know, germ theory of disease was starting to be accepted. Um, you know, all sanitation, I, you know, taking steps for to be hygienic. All these were kind of new ideas and they were starting to be put into practice for the first time. Plague was still a disease that was, you know, terrifying in many ways. Um, but at the same time, many people in Europe and then many people in the U.S., started looking at it through a racial lens, that you know, this is only a disease that Asians can get or people with you know, darker skin can get, that if somehow your, invest, your ancestors lived through Europe and all the outbreaks then, then somehow you've evolved immunity to it, which is ridiculous now in, in many ways. Um, but it was a very much a racialized disease. So plague came back, um, it's the same plague that did hit Europe. Um, the third pandemic started in uh, Southwestern China and around 1870 or so. Uh, spread down from the you know, Pearl River to Hong Kong and then spread throughout the world. So, you know, 10 million people died in China, 5 million people died in India. Uh, and there was this sense in the U.S. that, you know, this is a disease in you know, very racial terms, that this is only, you know, a rice eater's disease. So if you, if you eat meat, you have a Western, you know, muscular Western diet, then you aren't going to, re you aren't going to have this. You're not going to, it's not going to affect you. Um, and then there was a thought in San Francisco, too, that, this is only a disease of hot climates and you know we're we're in a famously foggy town uh, mm. that it can never spread here so there are lots of ways for people to mentally say i'm going to build this box of protection around myself mm. uh, and one of the themes of the book is that no matter how many things you do mentally you have to actually put them in practice that you know mm. the disease will break down whatever social constructs you've built around yourself mm. so uh can you tell us a little bit more about who, first of all, who Joseph Kenyon was um, and, um, well, the challenges and difficulties he faced, the hostility, really? Um, so and then he, maybe we can move on to Rupert Blue. So he was a, a, a surgeon and the forerunner of the U.S. Public Health Service. Um, he was uh, the foremost bacteriologist uh, in the country. He was in many ways considered one of the most brilliant doctors in the country. Um, he was sent to San Francisco not because of the plague, but almost in spite of it. He had a falling out with the Surgeon General, uh, and the Surgeon General essentially tried to send him as far away from Washington and the seat of power as possible. Uh, so he went to San Francisco. Uh, his job was to essentially uh, inspect all of the, the ships coming in, all the, the goods coming in through San Francisco Harbor, uh, which was, the, as is now, one of the gateways to, to Asia and the Pacific. Uh, so Kenyon, though, he was motivated in ways that you don't really see, you know, he was motivated by the fact that one of his children, uh, his, his youngest daughter, uh, died of diphtheria, uh, which is one of the most deadly and terrifying childhood diseases at that time. Yeah. Uh, he briefly stopped being a doctor. He then went to Germany and studied medicine. And he actually saw some of the first serums and vaccines and treatments for diphtheria uh, being developed before, before his eyes. And he took the data and he didn't want to believe it. He didn't want to say that this this is this could happen, um, but you know he he kept on imagining with every child who was getting this medicine and suddenly healing and being able to live a long life. He was able to he was seeing his you know his daughter's face and everybody, and he came away uh, awe inspired. He really thought that you know in the book I read that he thought it was you know Prometheus had returned and stolen another secret of the gods. He started thinking that anybody who died of disease, it was a case of manslaughter. He thought that science would advance so quickly that we would, you know, cure all diseases. And disease would be a thing of the past. He's a very idealistic person. And he goes into perhaps one of the most corrupt cities in the country. Right. So just, just briefly, explain uh, for our listeners again who may not be familiar, how he, how he was demonized, um, uh, how he became a hate figure. Really. He was... So he was, San Francisco very quickly wanted to deny that plague was there. Um, they had, there was a brief quarantine when they found the first known plague victim um, in Chinatown itself. Um, but within 24 hours, that was taken down. Can you know that though, he was the first one to, he took you know, tissue samples from the dead man's body. He identified that it truly was plague. And he tried to sound the alarm. 
and he knew that how what the danger plague represented that you know one person who was infected um you know was going got on a train heading east um suddenly you could have plague in you know, denver and chicago and philadelphia and new york and there'd just be no way to contain it um, so he continued to do whatever he could um, it was almost as if the, the person who knew that a storm was coming and trying to warn everybody before it was too late. That was mm -hmm. his position. Uh, but he, you know, he, he also did things that made people hate him. He tried to go through uh, Chinatown with forced inoculations of uh, a, an experimental serum for the plague um, that people started calling him the wolf doctor. Uh, he briefly quarantined the entire state of California and said that nobody could leave the state without a signed paper from him that said they were healthy. Mm. Uh, and this prompted some state uh, congressmen to say that he should be hanged. Wow. So um, one can't but help be, but be struck by the parallels with COVID-19 today and the way that Anthony Fauci is at this moment kind of being demonized and having war of the words with the White House. Um, do you think that's a, a fair parallel or is that? I do. And what's interesting with watching Fauci and, and over the last few months, it almost seems like he has gone from being in the position of Rupert Blue, which was somebody who, you know, people trusted and, you know, people kind of looked at him in a non-political lens to kind of moving into Kenyon, who was very much looked at through a political lens. Mm. And it, it seems like when you start attacking the messenger, it's usually a sign that you can't control the situation. And watching this demonization of science, that's one of the things I thought, you know, after writing the book, and I started writing the book in 2016, you know, the, the hardback came out last year, experiencing plague net or experiencing the pandemic now makes you realize in a different way all the things that you learned about before. It's, it's one thing to write about the quarantine. It's one thing to write about the de demonization of science. It's one thing to write about, you know, how medical experts were trying to save people's lives. People hate them. Uh, and then to experience it in your own, you know, your own day-to-day -day life, it makes you realize how it's almost an eerie experience. And that's one of the questions I was going to ask you, you know, as somebody who's written several books about the history of disease, um, how have you, and does, over the last three or four months, do you look back at your work and see it in a different way? Or are there, you know, different, you know, places that seem more illuminated now than they did in the past? Well, I, I think, yes. I mean, I think COVID-19 has um, prompted many medical historians to re-examine or re-engage with their primary sources. Um, so, uh, I mean, prior to writing this book, The Pandemic Century, I'd written... Um, two books actually, dealing with the 1918 Spanish flu and other in influenza pandemics. Um, and of course, when COVID-19, in the early days, everyone immediately compared it with 1918 and said, well, is this a big one? You know, everyone's been predicting uh, for the last 10, 15 years. Um, but what is interesting is that in 1918, we didn't, we had some social, we had some isolation measures and some public health messaging. And in some cities like San Francisco, famously, um, the authorities there mandated people wear face masks. Um, and it's interesting to actually speculate whether that was something that people were more ready to do in San Francisco because of the experience they'd previously had of plague. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that came up in your research, but there are all sorts of questions that seeing how people behave today in relation to COVID-19, mm -hmm. you then re-engage with, well, that either helps me understand these things that maybe I, I hadn't thought were so important. Mm -hmm. uh, but also it points out how we're living in a very different historical period because actually the main thing that 1918 has gone down in history as, is as the forgotten pandemic. Mm -hmm. So even though many more people died then than are likely to die from COVID-19. We didn't have this constant messaging um, every day from public health officers. You, know, you couldn't turn on your TV and see um, an update on the r naught and how many cases are in Texas and how many in Florida, right? Um, but also you didn't have the media amplifying everything in the same way. And that's something I really wanted to ask you about in, in, in 1904. So today you can't keep anything secret because we have social media. But what was striking about what happened in San Francisco is the way nearly all the newspapers, right, rallied around uh, the civic leaders and the politicians. 
Mm -hmm. I think you said that, I think some papers were more critical. I'm interested in that. Can you talk a little bit about the sort of, yeah, the, the way the press handled it? That's one thing that was the, one of the other, I think, themes of the book is, you know, what is the fact and how do you get true information out and how do you get people to believe what is true and mm -hmm. factual information that can save their lives. Um, in one of the power structures of San Francisco at the time was that the newspapers were very boisterous. You know, they wanted to only present San Francisco and California in the best possible way, mm -hmm. whether that was to sell more ads or to sell real estate or whatever else it was. So you had this, this kind of dichotomy of information where someone who lived in San Francisco, they would leave, read the local papers and they wouldn't cover the plague at all. Or if anything, they would start following the governor of California at the time was named Henry Gage. And you know, in an echo of today, he would uh, bestow nicknames on people he didn't like. So, you know, Kenyon was no longer Kenyon, he was suspicious Kenyon, or he was lying Kenyon. And the newspaper wow. write it. That, that, that way sounds just like someone I know. Yeah, I, I've never <laughs> heard that before. <laughs> but, uh, so he would, in the newspapers in San Francisco would follow that. And, you know, they would have editorial cartoons of Kenyon trying to pick the lock of the city treasury, that this was all just a big fraud of him trying to steal money. Um, but it was papers and news wires. Fake, out fake news, fake scientific fake, news. It was fake news. and. Now, or at the, at, the, at the same time, too, you have newspapers outside of San Francisco or news wires writing about the, the facts, the truth. You know, they were actually asking Kenyon and printing what was his estimations of how plague was spreading. So you had this dichotomy where people would say, you know, I'm terrified to travel to San Francisco. But then when they actually got there, they'd say, hey, everybody's walking around like this is normal, city, city life is going on, and there's not, you know, bodies everywhere. So therefore the newspapers must be lying. So it was, how do you, how do you get a true fact out there? And how do you get people to act in their own best interest? Well, you know, I, I was, you're reminding me also of the, um, the other outbreak of plague. So people, this may be a surprise to you, but there was another outbreak of plague. It wasn't bubonic plague, it was pneumonic plague. And it happened several years later in 1924 in Los Angeles. So, so Los Angeles actually had, you know, a dry, hot climate. So it was entirely possible that you could get plague in that climate, mm -hmm. uh, even by the sort of scientific theories of the day. But nobody actually thought that you could get the pneumonic variety, because pneumonic plague had only ever been seen in Manchuria during the cold uh, winter of 1910 to 1911. Um, so in the same way that um, I'm, I'm talking about this, obviously, because I, in your book, you, you cover the Los Angeles outbreak also, um, where again, you saw um, the, the Hearst newspaper group in particular um, play down. They wouldn't even use the word plague, I think, for most of the epidemic. Um, mm -hmm. They talked about an outbreak of mysterious pneumonia. Mm -hmm. um, and they even, in 1924, uh, made out that it was a, a recrudescence of the Spanish influenza. Mm -hmm. um, but what I found really, really interesting is, although the Los Angeles papers tried to keep a lid on it, um, the East Coast papers just, you know, actually massive sort of feelings of schadenfreude on the East Coast. It's like, yeah. you know, because Los Angeles had been busy boosting itself and saying how superior the climate and the conditions were to New York and Boston. So when the plague outbreak occurred, all the East Coast papers wasted no time talking about, you know, the Black Death in, in Los Angeles. So um, mm. I thought that rivalry was very interesting. Um, you know, uh, and I, I wonder if you, I, it makes me wonder about the way that when the outbreak of COVID was happening in New York, um, people didn't really think that, that that was a New York problem, right? This kind of rivalry between the coasts like persists through history. It's, it is interesting. I remember, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm forgetting which congressman exactly said it, but, you know, we're saying we shouldn't, the U.S. shouldn't wreck our entire economy because of the problem in New York. You know, right. that with, there's no, no, there would seem like there's no regular, no acknowledgement that, you know, disease travels, disease travels very quickly. Mm. And, you know, in the, the plague outbreaks, it was really the start of globalization. It was the first time you could really say if there's a disease anywhere, it's there's essentially that disease is going to be everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no hiding from disease, and it kind of shows the need for collective action. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I did think that you see those rivalries very easily. That you almost make that a comparison to like how 
London has a New York had a uh, competition with London for so long. You know, this is the new world, and you know everything, everything that way. And then Los Angeles compared to to, to New York is the same kind of uh, it's almost a spectrum it keeps on going. Uh, and 1924, I thought was so interesting too because you had you know Rupert Blue who essentially saved San Francisco in many ways was an utter failure during the 1918 flu pandemic, the Spanish flu. Um, you know, he, he was the Surgeon General at the time when there were hundred, you know, thousands of deaths across the country. He acted in many ways where he was too slow. He, he didn't institute many things that could have saved people's lives. Um, but he, he didn't quit. You know, that, he was removed from his position as the Surgeon General, but he stayed within the public health service, which I thought was remarkable because there's very few instances where someone has the top job at any institution and is relieved of their duties, but stays. And, willingly takes a, a lower role. Um, but he essentially, you know, he was about to retire. He almost came out of retirement to come back and help save California and by extension the country one more time. And that kind of arc, I thought that was, that's one of the things that drew me to the book too, is here's somebody who has had success and then utter failure and then had one more, more chance at success before the end of his life and, and that helped save others. Um, one, one thing I'm curious with you, you know, as you you, you've seen and you've, you've studied the history of pandemics and, and, and uh, outbreaks. How do you think, you know, kind of going back to 1918, it, you know, it's forgotten very quickly. Do you think COVID will be forgotten as quickly? And do you think that the behaviors that we now are used to, you know, the fact that when, you know, when I take my eight-year-old or a six-year-old somewhere, they're just used to putting on a mask. They put, they do it like it's second nature. And, you know, they're used to doing school over Zoom or, or something else. Do you think those behaviors are going to last? Well, I think these behaviors will last as long as we're having to live with COVID as an endemic infection until we get a vaccine. Um, but I think the main difference between today and 1918 is that, um, first of all, 1918 pandemic coincided with World War I. Um, so in terms of existential threats, war always trumps infectious disease mm -hmm. as you know it has better narrative lines in storytelling terms mm -hmm. so the flu was kind of overshadowed by the war um but the the other difference is we didn't have these long global supply chains um and you know although the mass movements of um, soldiers and you know troops from different parts of the world created the kind of conditions for the influenza to really spread worldwide um, it didn't have these massive disruptive effects on the global economy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what makes COVID-19 different. Um, even after we get a vaccine or the uh, epidemic pandemic runs its course, we're going to be living with these economic aftershocks for probably many years to come. And we don't even, we, we don't even know what that's going to look like right now. It could be really quite catastrophic. So I think for that reason alone, I mean, people don't forget the Great Depression, right? Um, this will be our version, I suspect. Um, but yeah, it is fascinating to, to think why and how, you know, um, different diseases play out different times in history. But I just want to come back to one thing. I wanted to ask a bit more about quarantines because, um, you know, we saw at the beginning of this outbreak how the Chinese quarantined a whole city, Wuhan, a city of 11 million people. Um, something that I, as a medical historian, would never have imagined was possible. I mean, quarant quarantines on that scale are without precedent. But I think it'd be interesting to go back and just really ask you, so given what was known uh, about plague and people didn't really know about the rat flea transmission, mm -hmm. so when the first vessels arrived um, at Angel Island and, you know, people were suspected of carrying plague, um, People thought the plague was carried by individuals and it was particularly racialized, right? The science around Asian individuals somehow being more susceptible or because of their living conditions being riskier. Given what was known about the science, and do, do you think that the quarantine, the first quarantine of Chinatown was justified in scientific terms? Um, um, to what extent do you think it was justified? That's a good question. And, you know, it's a question that if you had asked me before COVID, I would have probably given you a different answer. But okay. now, 
I can see in some ways I can see the justification. I can see when you have a threat that is that that can be that kind of existential threat that can kill millions of people very quickly. You know, plague is a very quick disease when you have it. It's you know forty eight to seventy two hours and you're yeah. dead. Um, I can see when you don't have much else to do, that almost seems like the only responsible thing is to do what you know, to seal it as tightly as you can, um, mm. to a certain extent, because, you know, what is the alternative? They, they didn't have any medicines, they, they didn't know what else to do, um, and they were responsible for people's lives. Um, I think how it was implemented, though, is a much different idea than does this abstract idea of a quarantine make sense? Um, mm -hmm. You know, it was implemented in a way that it was literally drawn along racial lines. That if, you know, somebody who was white or, or European uh, was within the quarantine zone, they pulled them out. You know, pl police officers, officers went in there with armed with weapons and, and basically pulled out all the white people and tried to keep all the Chinese and, and Asian immigrants uh, together. That, I think, is where the implementation starts to become, you know, we look back in the, uh, at foreign. Um, but the science of a quarantine makes sense. The implementation of it is, is much different. I mean, I think that's one of the things, you know, I'm curious now when you look at, we've had you know, economic lockdowns, we've had, we haven't had, in the, in the West at least, in Europe and the US, we haven't had the you know, strict quarantine that, as they have in China, but we've had essentially you know, self-quarantine or, or making it very hard to live your day-to-day your -day life. Um, how effective do you think those measures have been? And, you know, did you think that you would ever see something like that in your lifetime? Well, no, I, I just, I mean, so uh, I, did, well, I don't think we could have, what China did, they could do because they're a totalitarian society and they can compel their citizens to do all sorts of things that, uh, but what I didn't imagine, uh, even though I've studied a lot of these pandemics and plagues, I didn't think it was possible to compel citizens of a modern European or North American city to stay at home effectively have curfews um, during peacetime. But what I didn't anticipate is that people would do that voluntarily if we explained to them the importance of staying at home. Mm -hmm. And so what really impressed me is the extent to which the vast majority of the British population anyway have taken on board the science and the public health messaging um, and um, trusted uh, the government, even where the government has shown itself to be kind of incompetent, you know, and not really up to the job of managing a crisis on this scale, you know. So in the United Kingdom, we've had um, all the same problems with test kits. It's very hard actually to get a test uh, and get the results back rapidly enough so you know you need to isolate. Um, you know, it's all been very slow, very after the fact. Um, Do you see people and, in these masks? Yeah, I mean, so people, well, uh, it's difficult because, of course, the scientists have been giving contradictory advice on that. You know, some scientists will say they're convinced you should wear them, but you can still speak to scientists today and say, well, you know, there isn't enough evidence to change the current practice unless you're in a healthcare setting. Mm -hmm. uh, but the government has now told people they have to wear them when they're on public transportation. So people did that in San Francisco in 1918. You know, if you didn't wear a face mask on the trams, uh, you could be fined, um, I think $5, which is a lot of money back then. Uh, and the, that was money that was donated to the American Red Cross, <laughs> which I think is quite good. They should bring that back. But um, yeah. yeah, and you have to wear it when you go into shops now. But this is all very recent and too little too late. This should have been the messaging right at the beginning. Um, it seems like one of the issues here is that masks, especially in the western part of the country, have become a, a political, uh, a political yeah. place in a lot of ways. Um, do you see those same, do you see that same thing happening um, near you? Uh, well, yeah, I suppose there is a kind of um, people of a populist persuasion or on the right or who subscribe to more libertarian philosophy, who basically prioritize, you know, the individual's right to choose, um, and the right to, you know, keep their businesses open and carry on as normal. Those type of people, for some reason, um, see wearing a mask as some kind of affront, whereas really they ought to be seeing it as 
something that would aid them to get their business and normal life flowing again, because we'd be safer if we were all wearing masks. Um, so it is striking how it plays into a kind of populist machismo, and it is very much a machismo. And we saw that with Bolsonaro in Brazil, who's saying that he had nothing to fear from COVID because he was an athlete, you know, he was like this yeah. extremely fit individual, um, which, as you'll know from the science, um, everything we know about the coronavirus is that actually having a healthy, robust immune system may be what causes the um, inflammation that causes these terrible lung pathologies. Um, so it might be the opposite. <laughs> it might be better off to be, not be quite as fit and healthy. Uh, so it is striking the way it plays into um, these ideas of self-identity. Uh, yeah. But um, I, I just wanted to say to, um, we've been talking for like, well, almost 35, 40 minutes and it shouldn't all be about us. I mean, so please, if you've got any questions out there, uh, I think you can submit them via the Q&A function on Zoom. Uh, or I think there is some way of um, submitting them via Facebook. We're also live on Facebook. Um, yeah, oh, let me just check. We're getting something through on the chat. So yeah, we've got a question here, uh, David, from um, Irma. Uh, was there a public distrust of science scientists during 1907? Is it similar to what we see in swathes of the US now? So yeah, I think we've dealt with that, but maybe David, if you could reiterate, uh, was there this, there's this distrust of science uh, during the plague outbreak in San Francisco in 1905? There, there was in the first stages of the plague. What was interesting in San Francisco was that you know, after the earthquake, the, the plague and the disease outbreak that had been centralized in uh, Chinatown, which is, if you've been to San Francisco, really is right in the 12 blocks, right in the heart of the city. Mm -hmm. um, the rats which spread the plague then spread throughout the, the city because of the earthquake, there's rubble that could go in new places. Um, so this was the first time when people really realized that rats and specifically the fleas on rats were the vector of the disease. Um, so what they would do was, you know, they would, they pay people to kill as many rats as possible. Um, what is now, you know, our response to COVID is wear a mask as much as you can. Back then it was kill as many rats as you can. Um, and what, got people to trust science in a different way was there was, uh, you know, essentially that economic care that they wanted to grasp for. Um, there was the Theodore Roosevelt was sending around the, the Great White Fleet, which was, you know, this armada of ships, which was going around the world, uh, supposed to show American might, and it was supposed to land in San Francisco. Um, and it was, this was going to be a huge economic boost for the city. Um, the city at the time was also concerned that they were going to lose uh, the Navy, uh, the base of naval operations on the west coast to Seattle, which also has an equally deep and impressive port. Um, so Rupert Blue was able to say, unless I'm able to say that this is a plague-free port, I'm going to be unable to allow the Great White Fleet to land here. I can't put them all in danger. Um, so this was, you know, if you don't kill as many rats as possible, if you don't take these implementation, take this advice that I'm telling you and implement it, then um, you're gonna suffer a deep economic loss. And I think that's one of the things, you know, I wonder sometimes with, uh, we've had so much stimulus and, and monetary response policy, monetary policy response to COVID outbreak. Um, you know, there, you know, everybody in the U.S. essentially received a check, a stimulus check. Um, the Federal Reserve has made it so many businesses can essentially get zero interest loans. If we had a bigger economic carrot to wield over people or you know economic sword to wield how would that change people's behavior um you know you want this you kind of have that uh that balance between you want to make sure that people are able to survive um you know it's not their fault that if, if they were laid off or suddenly they have fewer hours or anything else and you want you know the humanitarian response but you also want people to say i need to do something and to change my behavior enough to uh, do something collective to make sure that everybody is safe here. Here's a great question. What drew you both to writing about plagues? Did your research and work prepare you at all for the current pandemic? Um, do you want to go there? Uh, let me have a quick go at that while you're thinking. You've got to, so, um, what, well, I mean, so um, I've been thinking and writing about pandemics and epidemics for the better part of 15 years. Um, uh, 
I suppose uh, the thing that really started my interest were the bird flu outbreaks um, in the uh, early noughties. So if you remember in around 2002, there was bird flu outbreaks in Hong Kong, followed by the SARS outbreak. And then there was a period in 2005 to 2006 where everyone was predicting the bird flu would be the next pandemic influenza virus. So I became interested then. Um, and I've been doing research in this area for a long, long time. Um, I mean, the fascinating thing, I don't know if you agree with this, but, um, uh, you know, you have all of human uh, life from politics and science wrapped up in one when you're writing about a pandemic. Um, uh, I mean, at root, they're great epidemiological detective stories because at the beginning of an outbreak, um, you know, everything is um, confused. You don't really know what's going on. There's an investigation. Uh, and then it immediately brings up... Um, these political tensions between the scientists who are bringing this unwelcome news to politicians and businesses and civic leaders, um, balanced against the need to protect people. Um, and, you know, this is particularly true in the United States, where you had a maritime hospital service, the federally run, you know, militarized public health, it was very, very powerful. Uh, and that immediately clashed with uh, local state interests, local commercial interests, tr traditionally centered on ports. Um, so you can find all of human life and social life, you know, pandemics aren't just biological phenomena, they're also social phenomena. And we can see that playing out massively with COVID-19. Um, did your research prepare you at all for the current pandemic? Yes and no. So um, I like to think that I was, well, I certainly was warning people much earlier than my government that, hey, you better wake up, this COVID, this coronavirus is a real threat. Um, I was always very cautious. I didn't want to say it's going to be as bad as 1918, but I certainly was worried very early on, started social distancing a long time before. I think also writing about pandemics, um, Unlike David, I'm lucky enough I haven't had COVID-19, maybe it would be different, but um, I always think that understanding infectious disease um, kind of makes you less afraid in a way. Um, it's the kind of opposite. It's kind of like you understand the enemy and you understand the risks and have more of a sense of, propor of proportion about them. So, I mean, even now with what the United States recording a record 75,000 cases yesterday, that's terrible. It's a huge number, but in terms of your individual risk, particularly if you're young, you know, it's probably pretty low. Um, that rate rises, of course, as you get over 60 and into your 70s. Um, so it's all about understanding risk, understanding uncertainty. And also, people often have a misconception that science has all the answers. Um, actually, science is always evolving. It's rarely settled. Um, and we've seen that play out massively with COVID-19 with even today people making different claims about, well, did we really need the lockdown? Isn't it just like a bad flu? So, right, we've heard Trump saying that endlessly. Mm -hmm. um, well, guess what? If you talk to a disease modeler, they'll tell you it's about seven to 10 times worse than flu, right? And it's, it's by far from over. So I think we have to really appreciate, uh, short answer, studying pandemics gives you a realistic understanding of the power and the way they really can transform and disrupt and expose all the fissures and weaknesses in society. Mm -hmm. um, but it also gives you an understanding of how, in a way, we've lived through a golden period where we didn't have to fear these infectious diseases. Uh, and that actually the longer historical perspective is that for most of human existence, pandemics and epidemics have been part and parcel of human life. And it's been one of those risks we've always faced. Mm -hmm. It is interesting. Uh, I um, think, you know, from, for me, well, I was gonna, to, yeah, go on. Yeah, for me coming to play, it was not, you know, I didn't approach it from the medical historian way. Uh, for me, what was so interesting about it was, you know, I find the time period between, you know, 1865, you know, end of American Civil War to World War One so fascinating because that really seems like that was the time where everything changed. You know, that was really the start of the modern world. And what we think of as normal is only about 100 years old, 120 years old. And it seems so fascinating that we, at that time, we also had to face, you know, an ancient disease, which, you know, is going back, we have records about it in 
the Justinian plague and all these other things. And I feel uh, what's so interesting to me about the San Francisco plague was just the personalities involved. Mm. They had somebody like Kenyon who seemed, it was almost like you could have an allegorical tale. And Kenyon was, you know, all these things that are so great about science, which is pushing the food pushing everything forward and, and understanding more about the natural world around us, but also at the same time imbued with a certain arrogance um, worth, you know, compared to Blue, who was somebody who had very social intelligence, um, but didn't necessarily have the hard science. And, and later in life, um, that lack of hard science was his undoing in many ways. He, you know, in 1918, yeah. he didn't react as, as well. Um, so I think that's what drew me to the play. Let's do another great question here. I think we kind of covered this a bit, but maybe we could ask you again, do plagues and pandemics often result in xenophobia? Yes. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is, David? Um, why was the, the outbreak in San Francisco so rapidly racialized and blamed on the Chinese? Well, I think you just want, there's a you know, gut reaction to say, this must be somebody else's fault. You know, I don't want to admit that there's this outside force that I can't see that uh, is going to affect me. And I need to pin it on something that I can see. And it's very easy to say, you know, this person is, this person is the other. I'm going to, to blame it on them. Mm -hmm. um, and what's interesting, too, is that, you know, pandemics and, and outbreaks and lot, lots of crises like this, it kind of reveals the fault lines that are already in society. They don't really, doesn't really make new ones. Um, so it becomes an issue where it's very easy to blame somebody else. And you'll see this in the same thing if there was a, an economic crisis. It's very easy to blame you know, immigrants or, or somebody who is in the minority. Um, and I think medicine and, and a plague outbreak falls into that category very quickly. Yeah. I mean, so the, the historian of medicine, Charles Rosenberg, calls epidemics sampling devices or framing devices that uh, open up a window on inequalities in society and um, the weaknesses of institution and all the stress, the stresses and fracture points. Um, but I think that what you say is true about, um, uh, you know, wanting to blame the other. Um, but I think also part of this is this, this um, uh, singling out of certain racial groups or at risk groups uh, is a product of epidemiology. So, um, given what was known about the epidemiology, I mean, all they could do is follow the cases. And if a lot of the cases were in the Chinese quarter involving Chinese people, in a sense, it's a natural assumption or a product of epidemiology to say, well, this is the risk group for plague mm -hmm. before you really understand the wider ecology, the role of rats. And actually we have to tell people they may not know this, but after plague was introduced to San Francisco, by rats that were brought on um, ships that crossed uh, from Honolulu. Uh, the flea vectors were transferred to domestic squirrels throughout California. Mm -hmm. So uh, afterwards, the, the reason plague, one suspicion about the plague outbreak in Los Angeles in 1924 was that it could have been actually introduced by squirrels from um, the countryside. Who, that, whose fleas were then transferred to rats and that outbreak occurred in the Mexican quarter. So that was also quarantined and blamed on the Mexicans and their, um, you know, there was also this always been this asso association between plagues and epidemics with dirt and, and poverty um, because the way people associated actually disease, not with specific pathogens, but with uh, the environment and, you know, noxious vapors. Um, so, Anyone who was unclean or bad smells were thought to be vectors of these diseases. So that's kind of really a hang, hung out, hangover from um, pre-scientific medicine. Um, so xenophobia. So here's another great question. Um, I'm guessing what the motivation behind this is. But the question is for both David and me. Uh, in your research, have you seen examples of effective ways that governments can disseminate medical information? So Dave, that's a great one for you, given the challenges that um, Kenyon and um, uh, the Federal Public Health Service, U U UPHS, had conveying the importance of quarantines and other information about plague. Um, uh, what, how would you uh, answer that? I guess it's motivated by the problems we're having today. Lots of people believe that uh, you know, 
they wouldn't take a vaccine even if you offered it to them because they think the whole thing's a hoax. Exactly. And that's one thing I thought was so radical about Rupert Blue at the time. And one of the things that drew me to the story as well was that, you know, at a time when it was very easy to say this is a racial disease, mm. he did the radical step of hiring Chinese immigrants to work with them and, you know, doing something as simple as walking through Chinatown and trying to kind of make those social connections with people um, to, to build up trust. And I think that is the biggest uh, fear now is that when there's so much trust lost, how do you build it back? You know, building trust is a very slow process and, and losing trust is a very quick one. Um, so you have people who are saying, you know, people who are anti-vaccines overall who'd say, you know, I think all the vaccines are a hoax, I never believe it. And then I think there was a story in the New York Times today or yesterday saying that there's now a, a growing number of people who say, I just don't trust anything that's connected with the Trump administration. So if the FDA did approve a vaccine, I think it's just been rushed. So I would never, I would never take it again. I would never take it anyway. So that, I think that will be the much slower process of how do you build trust back up in science and any of these breakthroughs. And people have to essentially see for themselves I think that's one of the proud, one of the reasons why this COVID-19 was able to spread so quickly in the U.S. is that it was very hard for people to see how quickly it could affect them, that it really was real. Um, you know, they didn't have the footage within uh, an ER or within an ICU unit of people on ventilators. Mm -hmm. um, they just heard, you know, tales or anecdotal tales of people in New York and, and you know, everything else. And it was only when it you start to see somebody or know somebody who has the disease or who had the disease that you start to take it uh, in a more serious way. Well, this brings us to a question from Ashanti. What do you think of your respective government's responses to COVID-19? Um, so in the case of America, do you think America could and should have been better prepared for this pandemic? I think so. I, I think the federal response um, and even the local response um, was lacking in many ways. Um, it's easy to point to the federal response, especially when you have, uh, you know, uh, Trump in many ways not wanting to, to do something as simple as wearing a mask. Um, you have state governors wanting, I think in Georgia, trying to sue cities that are uh, trying to implement masks. Um, but then, you know, even in places where you now say, oh, that's been successful, like New York, in many ways, you know, they, there was one study that if we had shut down the New York region, shut down two weeks earlier, um, the number of cases would have been cut by, you know, some huge number, over 50% or 75% or something like that. Um, so I think there have been a number of failures all the way down. Um, if you, you know, look at the number of cases that have been in nursing homes, um, I think in many ways that was a policy failure as well. Um, and hopefully, you know, we, we can learn from this, that it, in many ways it doesn't sound like COVID-19 is going to go away as, as quickly as many of us hoped um, back in March. You know, I, I, li I live right outside of New York and I work in Times Square itself. Uh, and I remember the last couple of days when everything started shutting down, we'd walk by a Broadway theater house and they'd have, you know, poster up saying, you know, we're shutting down for now, but we hope to reopen in April, on April 15th. Um, and now that just seems ludicrous. You know, there's, there's, no, there's not going to be Broadway shows until January at the early <laughs> You know, I can't imagine people going back into commuting in New York on a regular basis and life returning to normal, at least mm -hmm. until another year, you know, 12 months from now. Um, so I don't, I think it's going to be a very slow process to, to fix all, a lot of those failures. Listen, David, I don't think we've got much, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, and it's from Desiree. Uh, she wants to know, what was the hardest part of writing uh, your book? Uh, for me, it was the the sourcing in many ways. I, I really wanted to tell the story of the victims as much as I could, um, because it seemed like that was a, a missing component in some of the other treatments of the plague. Um, but I, you know, I don't speak Chinese, I, don't, I can't read Chinese. Um, so that was, that was an issue. And then the other one, you know, I, I've never, I was never trained in, in medicine, I'm not a doctor, I'm not an infectious disease specialist. So having to learn a lot of this um, on the fly, which was fascinating, you know, it's, it's a great way to learn it, is to, to learn because it's a great story. Um, but that was the, one of the bigger humps, you know. An English major tackling infectious disease is, is not always the, the most uh, seamless match. Uh, but I'd love to hear your experience too. Oh, 
Well, I, I've been, I've been uh, in, in my case, I, actually, I have to say, I, I am not uh, a, med, a medical graduate. I'm not, I didn't even study science. I did, I studied uh, philosophy and politics. So, uh, and I was also a journalist for many years, but um, I've been immersed in medical history for about 10 or 15 years now. Um, so yeah, it is a steep learning curve when you're having to understand how people understand disease today and how they understood it differently then. And you know, the role of not just bacteriology, but immunology, epidemiology, all these interlocking sciences. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, it's fascinating. Um, and uh, the, I think the hard bit is kind of, um, making that understandable to a lay reader because you have to kind of sometimes summarize quite complicated science um and especially when you're talking about a complicated uh, disease with with vectors so with plague you both have the the rat and the flea vector and all these things interlock and you have to understand that to even understand what rupert blue was doing you know and how he went about exterminating rats and and, and so even today you know with continually learning new things about the uh, animal reservoirs of these viruses. So, you know, the coronavirus probably emerged from a bat uh, reservoir somewhere in southern China. I mean, it's kind of remarkable. I suppose part of the reason why um, quite often these racialized ideas come out is quite a lot of these pandemics do actually originate in that region of Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And that's true of most influenza pandemics, for instance. Um, but, you know, in theory, it could happen anywhere. Swine flu started in Mexico and Southern California. Um, so we have to be careful about even being misled by the science in that respect. Um, but yeah, uh, I think one of the pleasures of writing a book like this is it gives you a kind of license, though, to delve into the science, but also to tell the stories about the individuals behind the science. And I, that certainly came across in your book, David. Oh, thank you. It was, yeah, it's fun to to see how one person interacts in their life shines in so many other things. So, you know, through one person's tale, you can tell the story of, of modern medicine, you can tell the story of, you know, how, why modern cities are able to be as hygienic and, mm. and have as many people in them without their yeah. being endemics all the time. Yeah. Okay, look, it was really great to talk to you. Um, I think you so we're at the end of our hour. So um, I just thank the organizers of Strand Books. Um, and all our listeners or readers, hopefully, who've joined us. Um, very nice to meet you, David. Nice uh, to meet hopefully you. We'll do it again in real life sometime when this terrible period is over. Well, thank you so much for making the time. I appreciate it. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs>